Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this afternoon's roundtable with the MICPA. Uh, today's topic is making remote work work for everyone. I'm Jody Skenesny, and I'm the Vice President of Member Engagement with the MICPA, and I'm so glad that you could all join us this afternoon for this really timely topic um, and something that I think at this point we're all looking for some new tips to how to re-energize, reinvigorate ourselves and our staff in our current, you know, work from home environments, whether it's all the time, part of the time, um, short term, long term. We all have different situations, but we can definitely all use some new information and some new uh, tips and tricks. I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, first of all, we have gone ahead and muted everyone. And we do want this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, please feel free. If you just move your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat feature. Um, if you click on that, the chat bar will come up and you can type your question right there. We will be answering questions potentially during the presentations, uh, depending how the conversation's going. Definitely after uh, all of the presentations, we're going to have a Q&A session. So we really do want it to be interactive with you and to make sure that you are getting the information that you want and need. Um, after the presentations too, we're going to have an opportunity to break into small groups very briefly and, um, and discuss a question that is pertinent to the conversation and really to all of us in this remote work environment. And then we will come back after our small groups and talk about the question and go right into the Q&A. Uh, and finally, we are recording today's presentation and it will be available on the MICPA website in the future. So if you missed something or if you'd like to share with someone in your network, uh, you will. we encourage you to do that. It'll be available to anyone via our website. So today I am pleased to introduce our host and moderator for our round table, and it's Sharon Beatham. Sharon is the Vice President of Finance with Hyratech America Incorporated. She's been there 21 years um, prior to working in corporate finance. She was in public accounting as well, starting her career with KPMG. And Sharon is the vice chair of the MICPA's Corporate Finance Task Force, who is bringing you this round table today. So thanks so much, Sharon, take it away. Thank you, Jody. Um, hello and, and welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you all here today. I, I heard earlier we have over 50 people who are registered. So that's very exciting news. Um, we're so happy that you can join us for, as Jody mentioned, this very timely and relevant topic that most of us have been living and enduring for at least the last six months or so. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of our um, uh, presenters today. Um, we have with us James Reed. Um, he is a partner at Dinsmore and & Chul, and he specializes in employment and um, business law. Uh, James is a business attorney who counsels business owners, serial entrepreneurs, C-suites, in-house counsel, human resource directors, and helps them make strategic business decisions from hiring and firing while complying with the ever-changing and overlapping uh, laws, including the ADEA, FLSA, FMLA, L, and LRA, and Title VII. Way too many acronyms there. Uh, he brings uh, a business and proactive approach to legal matters to help employers make strategic business decisions to minimize the potential for litigation and business disruption. When litigation becomes necessary, he enforces restrictive covenants and defends employers against charges filed with the EEOC, state and federal agencies. James regularly, regularly conducts audits and investigations into employers' wage and hour practices and claims of discrimination and harassment. He also provides training and prepares employment documents, including employee handbooks, employment agreements, and separation agreements to cover all aspects of the life cycle of an employee. James is a renowned keynote and national speaker at conferences, including events at the American Payroll Association, SHRM, HR Day. We're so excited to have James with us here today. Uh, follow, following James, we're gonna have uh, Linda Olenichak, and she's with the American Supplier, uh, American Society of Employers. 
Uh, she's been with them since 2018 as a director of membership experience. In June 2020, Linda transitioned to the role of director research services and event premium. In this capacity, Linda manages ASC research area and plans all ASC events. Prior to joining the ASC, Linda was responsible for developing and executing sales strategies throughout the state of Michigan and the national toy industry. She has had a successful background in the following industries, consumer products, professional associations, financial services, human resources, and professional sports and entertainment. She has experience in client relations and customer service and has built an entire HR department from the ground up. So we're very excited to hear from Linda today. And lastly, we're gonna have Dr. Robert Pasek. He's a consulting and executive coach. Um, Dr. Pasek has worked with a full spectrum of leaders from corporations, small businesses, startup, startups, government, nonprofits, and higher education. In 1996, he created the Leaders Connect, what began as a small gathering of about eight people to listen, learn, and advise one another. This has grown into a community of over 1,000 leaders from th leaders throughout Southeast Michigan and Northern Ohio who gather together to learn from distinguished speakers, including University of Michigan President, Dr. Mary Sue Coleman and Dr. Mark Schissel, Ford CEO Jim Hackett, coaches Lloyd Carr and Brady Hoke, authors and scholars, Jeff Zaslow, Robert Quinn, Jean Dutton, uh, Rich, Sher Rich Sheridan, and Ari Weins Weinzig, and Paul Saginaw, founders of Zingerman's. Dr. Pasek has documented his experiences and successes in, by writing eight books, which have led to the appearances on Oprah, The Today Show, and NPR. He has also had the honor of teaching at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan and consulting with the University of Michigan football team. So we're excited to have this great uh, team of panelists today, and let's get us started. And we're going to start today with James Reed. Thank you so much for having me here. I am super excited to share my little PowerPoint today. And I'm going to start with telling stories about the top 10 mistakes that we don't want to make with remote work and how to handle everything that's going on. Uh, what I'm hearing right now more than ever is the cumulative effects of everything going on from Black Lives Matter to the new Supreme Court decision involving uh, protected rights for sexual orientation to religious protections that also came out in the Supreme Court in July and also the politics and the election year. So everything added together and being at home and remote has essentially uh, suicide has been dramatically increased. Domestic violence has been dramatically increased. And uh, I guess the stresses as a result have also been dramatically increased. So we need to be extra sensitive in how we uh, make our employees feel safe, comfortable, and able to do their job. And what is very challenging is there was a hundred and plus executive orders. And then the court determined that those executive orders were unenforceable as a matter of law. However, my OSHA implemented uh, laws that are essentially mirroring the executive orders. So all companies have to have a COVID response plan. And this is mandatory. And uh, even if you are remote, you're gonna need somebody that can access the premises at some point just to get the mail and keep operations moving. And uh, if you don't have this plan, you can get cited and fine uh, thousands of dollars and be exposed to lawsuits for employees that are unsafe. There's been about 20 states that have passed laws limiting liability for employers with respect to COVID, but Michigan is not one of those at this time. Mistake number two is when you are remote, you may have a meeting uh, via online, like as we are right now. And I may see in your background, I saw you know earlier today, someone's political signs, I see religious icons, I find out if they have kids or not, 
you know, we're learning a lot of protected information that you are not supposed to take into account with respect to your employees. And uh, the first question I'm happy to answer on the spot is yes, this PowerPoint uh, will be made available. I also created a two page article to simplify this PowerPoint uh, for your enjoyment. So the issue with mistake two is that we can't take any family status if they're married or single, if they have kids or if they don't, uh, I can't take into account any protected class in any of my employment decisions, uh, such as bringing them back to work, letting them work remote. Uh, none of those things can be taken into account. So when you discover those, you need to make sure that you are uh, maybe having a committee where you're not just potentially having unconscious bias because right now, even if you don't intentionally discriminate, if you unconsciously factor that into your decision-making process, that is just as illegal as intentional discrimination. So one safeguard to protect yourself would be to make sure you have a provision in both your job application and your employment agreements that require disputes to be arbitrated, waive class action rights, and shorten the statute of limitations to bring a claim to 180 days instead of, for example, six years for a breach of contract. So I'm gonna cover 10 mistakes uh, and we're on number three. Number three, employers must educate their employees and provide training for all the COVID protocols. So every time you change your plan, you have to do a recorded webinar and provide this training for your employees to know how to follow best practice. <laughs> Even if they're not coming on site, you may want to provide this training for example, what if they're interacting with your customers in person at a coffee shop or other places, whatever your protocol is of how they need to act and wear their PPE and represent your brand uh, must be communicated and trained on. So make sure you make this uh, available uh, remotely. Mistake number four, which is probably the most important uh, topic for today's presentation is that you need to have a tailored remote work agreement. So it's called a telecommuting agreement, et cetera. And this agreement needs to make it clear that you know maybe this remote work could be temporary. Uh, maybe uh, they need to have a certain password in place on their personal computer if they're allowed to use a personal computer to access work material. Do they have a company laptop? Are, are they allowed to you know, leave the room without logging out and maybe their children, like I know my children come in and try to play on my computer whenever they can or email and text funny pictures to people. So make sure you have uh, protections in place and policies in place. Uh, how are you going to monitor or to maintain records? Can they store records on their personal computer? Uh, how are you protecting confidential information? Can you wipe out their information? Can you monitor uh, their cameras? Uh, you know, you need to have a clear policy in place. And I would also update your job description. For example, if you want them to come back, uh, some key buzzwords are, do they have interpersonal skills? Which means are they required to, you know, mentor or communicate uh, live with other employees or customers? So these are things you have to evaluate uh, if they need to be on site. You know, at our law firm, currently my OSHA says to the extent you're able to do your job remotely, uh, you should. And I'm in the office because I can't fully do my job remotely. I have new associates that I need to mentor. I need to be here to access the mail and, and do other day-to-day -day things. Mistake number five is that we're so focused on COVID, a lot of companies are missing other updates and laws. So if you didn't update your dress code policy to be gender neutral, based on the Supreme Court case, uh, you would be in violation. And uh, you may also wanna amend your, your handbook to include sexual orientation and gender identity as a protected class. And you may also wanna include uh, other updates like your stance on BLM. Are you going to add a Juneteenth holiday, uh, 
Are you understanding the overlap between the Michigan paid sick leave, uh, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, and, and your other PTO handbook policies? Are you updating all of those to be synergized? And in that regard, I'm seeing a ton of companies make mistakes where if an employee is allowed to work remotely, they're still paying them out of PPP funds or FFCRA funds. And if the employee is allowed to make up those hours at other times during the day and getting paid from the company, they can't double dip and also receive uh, federal funding or unemployment uh, simultaneously. And a lot of people make the mistake that the paid sick leave doesn't apply when someone's taking care of their child or their school's clothes. It only applies if the employee is sick and vice versa, the EFMLA only applies if the child's school is closed and they are unable to uh, have childcare. Another big mistake I'm seeing is that people are complaining on social media or on Zoom meetings about all these boring meetings and working conditions and when that's being done, that could be protected speech. Even if you are a non-union company, you can't terminate someone for an inappropriate uh, social media post complaining about working conditions or trying to improve uh, a labor issue without violating the National Labor Relations Act. So this is something a lot of companies don't know. Uh, mistake number eight is that it's very hard to understand conflicting or overlapping laws. So just because you found the federal law or you found the you know, MIOSHA guidance, you also need to make sure you're in touch with the Center of Disease Control, you're in touch with any local ordinance. For example, Oakland County, Washtenaw County have their own requirements uh, on top of any agency uh, regulation. So make sure you're understanding these and in general, uh, you need to follow whatever law is the most strict. Mistake number nine is the skyrocketing litigation. If an employee says that they are uncomfortable to come to work or unable to work at home for whatever reason, uh, or you know, requesting an accommodation, a lot of companies are unaware that sometimes unpaid time off needs to be offered as an accommodation to allow them to recover, or maybe there's some other simple accommodation that you could be making. And the definition of disability is broader than it's ever been. It can be stress, uh, PTSD, anxiety, uh, you know, compromised immune system. So we need to make it extra clear that we are talking to our employees and engaging in the interactive process, you know, maybe with a you know, remote school for their children, you know, working um, parents are under more stress and anxiety than ever. And if we notice something going on, we may need to accommodate them as opposed to just disciplining them. And I think the most important uh, issue is actually outside of the legal issue. And as we are seeing your business reputation, your brand and your image is more important than ever. So whatever you're doing, silence is not enough. So if you're not out there promoting your brand and just being silent, what are you gonna say if an employee asks, what is your position with respect to BLM? Are you allowing your employees to show up on these meetings and wear political clothing or a BLM pin or Me Too movement or, you know, LGBTQ, what is your position on, you know, other social media issues in the workplace? And, you know, it's also a great time to update your social media policy and maybe also make it clear what your policy is on politics in the workplace. For example, if you're not, if you're a private company, not a governmental entity, uh, there's no such thing as First Amendment free speech. So you can restrict uh, someone's speech in that regard, as long as it's not potentially protected activity to improve working conditions under the National Labor Relations Act. So that's my quick 10 minute 
top 10. And uh, for those of you that want more information, uh, we uh, have a business strategies hub where we're putting together the latest and greatest material and summarizing all of the recent case law. So with that, I will stop my screen share and pass it back to Sharon. Thank you so much, James. That, that was uh, very enlightening. I, I noted a couple of things myself that I'm going to follow up with our HR team on and make sure that we're checking into. Uh, I'm not sure if we've done all those things. So I uh, appreciate all that valuable information. Um, so next up, we have uh, Linda Ol Olenicek with the ASE. Thank you, Linda. We're excited to hear what you have to say. There we go. I think everybody can see my screen. Uh, I have uh, two screens up, so any direction on that, I think you guys are good. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me today. And I can definitely um, uh, hear James's presentation and see a lot of what our ASE members are going through with everything he had to say. It's a great connection to what I'm about to uh, go into. So happy to collaborate today with everybody in the MICPA. My husband's actually a proud member. So I know a lot about cramming in those CPE credits at the um, end of your deadline. So a little bit about uh, ASE. We're Michigan's largest employer association in Michigan and a trusted HR partner to over 700 different organizations. So I'm gonna jump back into March of 2020. <clears throat> and I can kind of remember it so vividly because ASE had to cancel their largest ASE, uh, ASE HR conference scheduled for March 12th. And soon after we had a general staff meeting, um, you know, and a couple of our colleagues, of course, thought, oh, we'll be back in two weeks. But as we know, seven months later, we still don't have a return to work date. And uh, luckily for us, we had some things in place because we were already working remotely two days a week. But like you, many of our ASC members who were previously resistant to working remotely were put into an immediate work from home experiment, I like to call it. So today I'm gonna to discuss some examples of what you can do to sustain this. So according to our most recent ASC COVID-19 business practice survey, 77% of our ASC members workforce is still working remotely and 45% of them have no return to work date. And a couple more statistics I found interesting is that 86% of employees expect work from home become, to become the future of work, but unfortunately only 28% of the organizations plan on making it a permanent thing. So there's a large gap there. So again, this year has been an extraordinary moment for remote work, but there are many benefits to it. Um, it saves money for both the employee and the employer. It does actually reduce employee turnover. It reduces our environmental impact and employees tend to be more engaged according to our surveys. But employees have also cited some challenges too. There's loneliness. It's hard for them to understand when to unplug from work. They get distracted. You know, being a parent myself, you have kids working remotely. My husband's working remotely. We're trying to all be on the internet at the same time. And of course, uh, I, we just did a webinar this morning on wellness. So staying motivated and staying healthy are some of the challenges that employees are citing. And I just saw an interview with um, Barbara Corcoran from the Shark Tank that some of you may know. And even she was stressing how she could not transition to this remote work. She said it was the hard, one of the hardest things she's done in her career. And she finally just had to set up core business hours for herself so she could unplug and turn off all her notifications and put away her phone and relax. So even someone at her level found this very stressful. So let's take a closer look at some building blocks to build that successful remote environment. So I'm gonna talk about first people, obviously your biggest asset, and you have to create and sustain a strong remote team. So some things that you can do right now, especially if you're still in this remote world, and you have to start recruiting virtually and interviewing. And similar to what James was saying is you need to update a lot of your documents, documents to work in this digital world and to stay compliant. But you also wanna update some of your documents such as your do job description to clearly outline the role and provide them some perspective, that prospective uh, candidate, let them get a better visualization of your team and job expectations. And when you are interviewing, 
you know, just remember that the qualifications, uh, conversation skills, their abilities are still essential characteristics of what makes up a great interview. But if you haven't been using assessment tools, you may want to start using some qualified assessment tools at this time to assist you in getting better hires. And just with onboarding, onboarding try to include everyone in your organization. Uh, that way, even if you don't think that new colleague is going to intermingle much or talk to someone on your staff, just do some introductions so they get a better overall picture of your entire organization. And of course, performance management, you want to continue to do frequent and detailed feedback, set some goals, and keep up with these action items. And of course, learning and development and career development is always crucial. So of course, your culture is based on your values. So when working remotely, it's important to build up your values. And of course, this is a two-way process. Your HR team and managers must trust that employees are working from home and employees need to keep up their side of the bargain too. So having your core company values can help you ensure that each of your employees from the top down are working towards the same common goal. And of course, you can always take your team's pulse. You can survey them, um, measure your organization's overall engagement. You wanna know if they're really happy, loyal team members working remotely, or maybe there's some bigger issues that you need to address. And engagement surveys can certainly pinpoint areas to improve before they become a big issue. So of course, employee disengagement is a huge risk, but employee engagement may determine how your organization recovers from this pandemic. So even during this crisis, you know, I wanna coach you to not stop that annual engagement survey. If you always do one in October, continue with it. You may be surprised at the answers that you get. And if anybody needs assistance um, with that, I wanted to send out a resource to everybody um, from our partner, McLean and Company, that'll help you with engagement during the pandemic. And I'll send you this DIY resource and the tools and tricks to help you do that on your own. Um, just write engagement in the chat function. So um, when Joni and I were talking about today, we were talking about communication and just how critical it is to keep everybody on the same page. So employees need to clarify, you know, may need clarity from your managers and HR on how can they communicate, when, how much. I mean, it's been a really big balancing act for a lot of our, our members on how to do this right. So a lot of times things that come up is, you know, is it okay to share our calendars, our hours? Do I have to put a particular I am status, a do not disturb or out of office notice because I'm doing a webinar today? And all of these things build trust, but sometimes they can also make it seem like someone's watching you. So you have to find that perfect balance for your company. Uh, you need to determine how often do you need to meet as a team versus how often you should meet one-on-one. -on -one. And actually, we're trying to do something where we should have a no meeting day. So a no meeting day does allow for a little bit more productivity, or especially you might want to put some of these together when you're about to hit those important deadlines in your company and gives your, your team a bit of breathing room. So make sure you share some guidelines and reg regarding how you want communication to happen. And of course, always keep that digital door open for feedback. So I've tried to identify seven best practices to optimize meetings for everybody here on the um, webinar today. This will help make them purposeful, actionable, and still want to keep them punctual. So an important part of working virtually is communication, again, is finding that balance. I always try to coach our members that you have three audiences. You have your organization, your individual departments, and of course, your individual employees. So back in March, April, May even, we all were, gosh, everybody's gotta be on the call. Everybody's gotta be on this virtual meeting. And now it's October, we kind of can take a breath. We can step back and you know, ask ourselves, is it really has to be a camera? Does it have to be a virtual meeting? Would this work in an email? Do I need to have 16 people on this call or can I do 16 people in an email? Or maybe that old fashioned way of just pick up the phone and uh, call a colleague or business associate. So these are just some of the practices that we find optimize your meeting for productivity. But the other biggest challenge we get asked about a lot is how do we equip our managers now to manage remotely? 
and how do we keep everybody productive? So those are some of the things that we're getting asked a lot about. So one thing we do coach on is that our members, um, for our members managers, they don't have to go out and learn a whole new set of competencies in order to manage a virtual team, but they might have to dial up certain, certain competencies that they don't use as often on site. So again, it's important to set those expectations and you know, virtual employees do crave meaningful interaction with their managers. So make sure that you do that and also um, coach your employees to interact with each other. Maybe have a virtual coffee in the morning with someone. So this slide just gives you a snapshot of some remote work best practices and following what James said, a work from home policy is very important. Um, if anyone needs one, I can surely provide that for you. Setting those expectations with some core hours, continue with your time off request processes. Very, very important to document all of these things. And no matter what, you could have some poor performance issues going on despite the pandemic. So again, training, you wanna train your managers to bring these things to your HR um, staff's attention. You wanna evaluate that root cause of the performance issue. And of course, have a clear process for improving the performance with that employee. I'm not a subject matter expert in security, but you definitely should make sure that you have security policies and procedures in place and a cloud service or a shared document service in place to safeguard your company. In addition to that, you will definitely wanna have some tools and tricks up your sleeve, communication technology, such as what we use, Teams. You could have project management programs, learning management systems, and applicant tracking systems, and of course, virtual training. So I know it's not that simple to just say, hey, Linda, take your laptop home and connect to our VPN and everything will be safe and secure and it's gonna go great. But we definitely have to continue the same human resources building blocks we use when we're on site. Um, keeping these things in place are essential to help your organization recruit, retain and develop your workforce and of course stay compliant. So I wanna thank everybody today for having me uh, one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we, I just wrote an article on 2020 being a growth mindset. So I think we can all agree that 2020 has forced us to change. We've had to adapt and certainly new, learn new things in order to be resilient in our organization. So thank you so much. And I will hand it back over to Sharon. Thank you, Linda. Lots of uh, very good uh, ideas there. Um, definitely, I think I might try out this virtual coffee. And uh, we have been trying to do this uh, no meeting morning. We, we do Monday morning no meetings, but it uh, doesn't always work as planned because um, sometimes that's the only open slot and uh, with the people you need to talk to. But we try really hard to block our calendars and say no meeting Monday is our goal. So definitely very good ideas. And we appreciate all of those that valuable information. Uh, last up, we have uh, Dr. Robert Passick. We're very excited to hear what you have to bring to us today. And uh, I'm going to go through a few tips. Uh, some of them are going to be a little bit redundant to the great tips that have already been provided. And then I'm going to try to give a question that we're going to talk about in small groups. So I'm going to share my screen at this moment. And uh, Go oh, from there. All right. Try to share the screen. It didn't work. Let's try one more time here. Uh, I think I'm just, what I'm going to do, I'll be having a little trouble with the, sh the screen sharing. So I'm just going to talk from my, my points, and the slides will be out there uh, when you, uh, when you, when you, slide out. So the first thing I want to say is um, working with a lot of companies, I notice that people have a great deal of difficulty uh, missing sort of the informal side of all this. So, uh, you know, the, the kind of thing we're, we're coming up to a football weekend and the kind of thing where people are sitting around uh, over lunch or over a coffee and just talking about, are you a Michigan State or a Michigan fan? And, you know, who's wearing what shirt? So I think for that, 
uh, one of the techniques that I found useful is to start meetings early. Uh, and that is would be, uh, so for example, uh, this meeting started at noon, maybe have uh, people coming on at uh, quarter two, starting the meeting early and letting people just chat, having somebody maybe facilitate that so they could call on different people who, who are joining and say hello and, uh, and just kind of create that informality of, of the office meetings that happen regularly. Uh, secondly, um, many people don't like to speak up in, in big groups. And so they, uh, they don't want to speak on a Zoom meeting because they're fearful. Uh, they don't know how the technology. They're worried that things are not going to work right. So I think in that regard, um, one of the things to do is to use this breakout room feature that we're going to uh, be using in a few minutes. And that is maybe present your topic. But if you have a bit, you know, more than uh, six people, break them into groups of three and have the, each group then present a question or do a chat. And then it makes the people who are less uh, outgoing feel comfortable in terms of sharing their own ideas. A third problem that we see often is that everybody seems to be stressed today uh, for some reason or another. Um, I've seen uh, a woman recently uh, who's an executive and she has a, she's in her 60s, but she has a mother's in her 90s that she's looking after. She has a, a child, a grandchild in, in town that she's looking after, and she has grandchildren out of town. Plus, she's trying to take care of the company and herself. And I think this kind of situation isn't unique, that people are very stressed about something or other in their lives. People are worried about staying healthy. They're worried about the election, which is on everybody's mind. Uh, they're worried about the six months of winter that's about to come up. It's kind of like something out of Game of Thrones where winter is coming and it's here. And so I think that it's, it's really important to not just think, well, the people who are obviously stressed, let's say because their, their children are home are the only ones stressed. People have a lot of stuff going on. And it's important to let people know that you care about that and that they're, you're tuned into their issues as well. So um, I think another thing that we see is that um, there's a lot of people who um, are not PowerPoint oriented and actually aren't watching the screen when, when they're, they're doing a Zoom meeting. I mean, we see a lot of multitasking going on. So you can't assume that people are reading your screen and reading the, the slides and everything. And I know in accounting firms, there's a lot of data and it's very hard to assume during a presentation that people will dig in. So I encourage people to keep the slides to a minimum and to keep the content to a minimum as well. So that and people we've seen so far today are doing a good job of that. But it's, it's very hard, I think, to uh, to look at the slide and try to get deep information about it. So what you want to do on a Zoom call is really have it more of a conversation rather than just information planning. Um, the last thing I would say is that people, um, people miss the human connection. Uh, I'm a psychologist and research after research shows that the human connection is what keeps us alive, that most people thrive on friendship. By the way, uh, research has, has greatly shown that both men and women thrive best when they have female friends. A little factoid for you there. But uh, female friends seem to be the best in keeping spirits up, both for men and for women. Uh, we get into a whole other thing about, is it okay for men to have female friends? But I think at work, it's very easy for men to be close to women and, and kibitz with women and enjoy it. And when they're at home and uh, they don't have that access, it's very hard. I'm noticing women are doing much better at gathering with other people, whether they have a virtual bridge game like my wife does, or they uh, have just virtual chats or even a hike. They're doing better, but the men don't seem to have that way of getting connected uh, to other men if they're not face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, we have to think about ways to manage that. And then I think it's also important to think about having one-to-one -one connections with your staff. I think one of the hardest things for a manager in any time is that sense of com communicating with your employees that you care about them as, as people. Uh, and it's even harder uh, with, with, with the uh, remote. So how do you show that you care about people? And uh, I think I have a one, one or two minutes to talk about this idea. I don't know how many of you have heard of the five languages of love. If you have, raise your hand. But I think that's really important because the, 
this uh, research shows that people don't all feel love and feel cared for in the same way. Uh, and the five ways, and I always forget them, so I wrote them down, is some people like to receive love by human touch. Well, you can't do a lot of touching these days in the workplace anyway, because of all the, uh, the fears about excessive touching. Uh, but you, over the remote, you can't do any touching at all. You can't even shake hands. So people who need reinforcement and show love that way, it's very hard. Other people like to receive gifts. And around this time of the year, uh, we're thinking about Christmas gifts, about uh, awards that can be given. Uh, um, they like to receive gifts of money. Um, so these are, you know, tuning into the people that like that and sending them gifts is a good way to do that. That might be just sending them something funny that, that just shows that you care and that you're thinking about them. Uh, you can even send a gift of passing something on like through, uh, through the internet. You saw an article uh, that you thought that might be interesting for Jane. And so you send it to Jane. And that's a gift. It's a way of showing that you're thinking about that person. Another, uh, a, a third way or a fourth way of, uh, it's, it's touch, gifts, attention is another way. Just being attentive to, to your, your friends and, and showing that you're, you're, you're invested. And when you're with them, you're not looking at your phone or you're not distracted. Just showing that gift of, I'm, I'm totally attended to you. Well, again, that's hard on, on remote work because people uh, are more distracted. You don't know whether they're actually attending uh, to you or not. Uh, so when you give yourself to over to other to people, give yourself fully to those people that require that and, and, and care about it. Another is what's called a gifts of service. That's the fourth one. And gifts of service is like doing things for people, uh, being sure that uh, the, the, the walk is shoveled or that, um, you know, the mail is picked up if, if it's a remote thing. So how do you give gifts of service during uh, times of Zoom? It might be sending uh, a gift of service, sending somebody, uh, we're going to pay this year for your snow removal, or we're going to you know, do something special because we know it's hard for you. We're going to send you things about, uh, you know, we're trying to educate your kids. So we're going to sign you up for, uh, I, I've been sending my grandchildren something called KiwiCo, K-I-W-I-Co. And it's a gift box every month that comes with educational and artistic uh, project for, for somebody. So that might be something to send to people who you know are trying to educate their kids. And the last thing is that a lot of people love uh, to be affirmed. They like to just be reinforced and told they're doing a good job and add a boy, add a girl, so on and so forth. So again, you have to tune into which of your employees require which of those kind of games, uh, kind of shows of affirmation. It's not just one thing for everybody. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this back and uh, we're going to talk in small groups and the topic I'd like to show, I'd like to ask people to address in the groups once you introduce yourself to each other is how do you show that you care to your employees in a remote environment? So that's the, the question. How do you show you care in a remote environment? So Sharon, I'm going to turn it back to you and hopefully we can move into small groups. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Um, I think Jody is helping to arrange these small groups. Um, so I think everyone's going to get in a group with what, three to five people, something like that. Yep, we've got five people per room. We are going to break out for um, probably just five minutes to have this conversation on how do we show our staff, our colleagues, our employees that we we care about them in this remote environment. I think that's a great question and not necessarily an easy one to answer. So um, what's going to happen is you're going to kind of go into these groups and um, there'll be four or five people per group chat for a few minutes, get to know each other, share some ideas, and then we'll come back together as a group and also do any more, um, answer any more questions that you may have. And we may touch on the subject a little bit once we're back. So we will see everybody back here in five minutes. You won't have to do anything. It'll automatically send you out into the group and then back into this one. We'll see right. you shortly. Awesome. Thank you, Jody.
Hi, do I have folks in my group? All right, I'm starting to see people come back from the breakouts. We'll give everyone a few minutes to get back into the main room. Okay. Great, still coming back in. Very yes. good, excellent. Oh, Sharon, you're back. I, I'm back. I'm back. I, I was probably too talkative in my in my little. <laughs> I was able to. Um, I kind of popped in on one and was able to to listen and share too, and that was fantastic. Really interesting to hear what people are doing, and also just kind of find out how um, how they've handled, you know going back or not going back or working remotely and um, one of the participants said that they never worked remotely they were just closed during um the first you know oh, wow. eight weeks or so and and then went back in person so fascinating the way that everybody's been handling it yeah. um i do want to allow for questions too if anybody has any questions of the panelists or just of the group um feel free to type those into the chat but um if anybody had anything that was specifically um you know enlightening or just that you felt was a great idea that you learned in the breakouts please feel free to unmute yourself and share with the larger group any just great ideas out there? I'm sure you must have had some. I enjoyed in our breakout group, one of the people, Sarah, had her actually company logo in her home office in the background. So it kind of still had that nice branded company vibe, even though it was a you know personal residence. So I think if we can send swag to all of our employees working remotely, just a little bit, whether you know, a coffee cup or something, I think it helps with the culture and, and the brand. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. I like that. And I know one of the persons in our room, they're doing the, like the coffee break, you know, the coffee meetings and, you know, things like that. So I, I was, it's very interesting to hear um, how everyone's trying to stay connected. It's, it was awesome. I would like to encourage everybody to um, jot in the chat their best takeaway from the day. And we could come up with an interesting list, you know, of 30 or 40 of these best idea that that you heard that you're going to something you're going to do an action item that you're going to follow up on just like you said you know uh something you would do or uh the the, the swag idea is that legal james by the way i want to be sure we're not breaking any laws here <laughs> it's legal as long as the employees don't make more than minimum wage if they have to pay for it but it's always okay. legal to own something free all right <laughs> That would be great if you could just type, yeah, one of, one of those takeaways, something that you're going to implement into the chat, and um, I can include them when we send out the slides and follow up information from the meeting as well. So um, please do share one of those great takeaways and I, I'll leave the names off. I'll just put the ideas into the list. Great. I see them coming across. I like that virtual bingo. That sounds. I great. like that too. That does sound yeah. like fun. Yeah, I have to learn how to play it, but uh, without touching the the. Uh, I guess bingo is something you don't have to touch, like cards. You can't play very easily. We've done a lot of uh, different large group trivia type games too. Uh -huh. and those have those have been a lot of fun. Yeah. 
people seem to like the meeting free days. That was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to add in here, we're talking about how to help people at work, but this is also a great time to reach out to people who you haven't uh, been in contact with in your life, uh, old friends, uh, neighbors, just checking on how people are doing. And I, I found this has been really nice to reconnect uh, with a lot of people who I, you know, didn't know they were do how they were doing. Somebody was going in for surgery. Somebody was, you know, getting a little bit older and I just happened to call. And he said, oh, I'm glad you called because, you know, I'm going in for surgery next week. It's great to hear from you. So I think uh, using your free time to use the old telephone and just call people is a great way to, uh, to feel good. And when you do something for others, you feel better about yourself too. Absolutely. All right, well, we've got some good ideas coming across. Um, and while you guys continue to share those great takeaways, um, I do want to remind you that uh, this we have recorded this presentation so that you can share it um, with you know, colleagues or within your network um, that'll be available through the MICPA's website. There will be a follow up email uh, coming to you with the presenter slides, these tips. And, um, and James had said as well that he had kind of a nice summary of his presentation that uh, he can share with you. And so look for that in the coming days. Um, we do offer these round tables occasionally. We did them almost weekly at the beginning of um, uh, of the stay at home orders. And now that our friends in uh, working in tax are starting to be able to come up for air again, we're going to be offering them a bit more often. So we do have one scheduled um, or will be scheduled soon for just after the election with um, uh, our um, legislative um, kind of advisor and he's going to be giving us a legislative update so you can look for that whatever happens with the elections from the state's perspective, he'll be able to tell us the impact that that may have on the profession. So you can look for that coming in November. Again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hope that you found it beneficial. Always looking for feedback. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email and let me know of future topics that you might be interested in hearing about. And again, I wanna thank our Corporate Finance Task Force for putting this presentation together today. And you can look for more presentations like this coming from them in the future months too. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you, Jody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone.